Good morning and a warm welcome to Macau and the Macau Grand Prix. We are about to get underway for the first event of the day and it's qualifying for the gear race. And it's quite special this year because we have a new era for tin tops, a brand new era worldwide for touring car racing. And that is known as TCR. And uh, it's an interesting spec, two liter turbo cars and some top manufacturers represented from Opel, Seat, Honda, Subaru, Ford, Volkswagen, and Opel, and uh, more to come, I'm told. And that's really exciting news. And the whole point of this series is to make touring cars a little bit more accessible for the teams and a little bit more affordable. But it still attracts the greatest drivers in the world, including this man, Rob Huff of Great Britain. Would you believe it? He has won this event seven times already and he's still raring to go and make it an eighth. He arrived here, as always, like Rob Huff does, bouncing off the walls. And while he does his thing, there's a championship to be won. Stefano Camini of Switzerland takes on Pepe Oriola of Spain. And look at the difference, just two points between them. Jordi Genet of Spain also has a mathematical chance with 55 points up for grabs. He's 34 points behind. But I think he's going to be playing a a waiting role, so to speak, in terms of his position in this. If he can go for it, he will, but he's just got to stay in it to win it sort of thing. But I think it's going to be a really almighty battle between Comedy and Pepe or Oriola. And it's been that way all season long. This youngster from Spain who's been, I said earlier, I joked earlier that he was born in a SAT because he's pretty much been driving for them since he was 16 years of age. And uh, he is one of the best Seat Leon drivers in the world. And he's got a chance to be the first TCR champion. And it's between him and Comedy for that champion. You can see them sat next to each other in the back of the paddock here. But there's plenty of other players who can play a part here at Macau. And that's the beauty of this amazing street circuit is you never know at Macau what's going to happen because it all forms out on a grid, and then suddenly everybody gets down to the Lisboa. There's an almighty shunt, and it's all out the window. Afanasiev is one. There's Komeny, and as you can see, alongside his rival. Seat, uh, may I add, will take both the drivers and the manufacturer's title. <laughs> Stefano, he's a great character. I just saw him at seven in the morning, I may add, and he was like, ah, how are you? Let's go get a beer. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, after the day's over. <laughs> he's a great guy, and I was asking him about his knee. He had a knee operation, and you're not going to believe this story. He dropped a settee, a sofa, on his knee. He was doing some moving in between races before Thailand and had to have surgery on his knee. Now, I don't know if that's a, a wives' tale or a long story or whatever, but that's the story that is officially out there. And uh, it's, um, it's just a great character. Meanwhile, Pepe Oriola is young, fast, and ready. And Stefano knows it. And it really has been, uh, they have battled around the world, a really amazing battle between them. And like I said, the last installment was in Thailand at the new Chang circuit. And before that, Singapore. And there are other players like that man, Velia. We've also got the top Asian series entries in here. Michael Choi leading the Asian championship and looks as though he'll pretty much wrap it up this weekend. He's got a, a lead over Philippe de Con of France, but Philippe is actually a team owner, a team manager of ART Racing in Asia. He did the first few races, got some great points. Um, and Michael Choi has been ever present, um, but I don't think anybody else is gonna catch Michael. So it's a good, good opportunity for him. Just saw him this morning, really looking forward to his outing here. Likewise, had a quick chat with Frank Yu. He's been giving a three penalty placement on the grid. I can't remember what it was for, but uh, he was very upset by it. And I said, ah, don't worry about it, Frank, you'll be right. It's going to be interesting to see Rob Huff and see what he can do. Alongside me, Alan Hyde. And Alan, what are your thoughts on this new era for Tin Tops? A very exciting time. And this is an incredibly prestigious race, the uh, 
gear race here at Macau and uh, to have these uh, new look cars and as you've quite rightly said Jonathan uh, a huge manufacturer support in their first year in this uh, new form of touring car racing it's uh, really very impressive and when we use the word impressive we cannot ignore Rob Huff as you've already said seven wins uh, here at Macau and to come in this weekend to uh, this series as the the super sub if you like the uh, man drafted in because he is such an expert here at Macau and we've had two sessions so far two practice sessions so far and for him to have been able to um, dominate those sessions and top the times in both of the sessions he is here to make that seven wins night absolutely no question about it this weekend yeah I hadn't thought about that it's yeah. not just a matter of getting eight he wants to get both yeah he will want to get two wins this weekend and uh, well so far um, <laughs> he's seen pretty unassailable hasn't he very very impressive yeah in that second practice he did a 233.7 compared to Pepe Oriola's 234.8 so he was a second quicker over second than anybody else on the uh, just um, one thing that I spotted as they were going down the cars in the uh, in the pit lane it looked like Josh Barnes car was out he's been drafted in for uh, this weekend uh, an outing uh, a former UK Clio Cup champion is Josh Ross, and he had a big accident very early on on uh, Thursday morning, didn't he? And uh, that car was quite badly damaged. It wasn't out yesterday, but it seems that it's going to be out for today, which is good news. Yeah, another sad uh, story. Uh, one of the other great champions of this Macau race here, the Gia race, as it's known, uh, Alain Manu uh, from Switzerland also, as uh, this Stefano Camini. Um, is not going to be taking part in the Subaru. Let's go on board with Stefano as we go around this amazing gear circuit. Down towards Lisboa. This is the fastest part of the track. We head down towards the Lisboa right-hand corner as Nash is already parked up in the Ford and looks like the wrong way round as well. Through Lisboa we go. Gearbox down to second gear. Flipping through here and then changing up quickly. You'll see him go up the hill and change through. Fantastic onboard pitches here. Glowcast, thanks to them. And up through San Francisco, climbing up the hill to hospital. Then it's hard on the anchors and through, literally, the tunnel-like section through Maternity Bend. Now it's past Teddy Yip Corner, and now it weaves from left to right, wall after wall, and you've got to get this precise. It's so hard, and it's all going on. Samson Chan's gone backwards as well. There's the parked four down the hill, through the Solitude S's, and then the next stage, just after this lip, is downhill all the way. Here we are, starting to go downhill, fourth gear through here, and as you can see, just flipping through the gears on the uh, steering wheel, and then hard right through police. You can see great onboard shots of how he's going through it, up to Moorish Hill, right-hand turn, second gear, heading down towards Donna Maria now for the first time. A flick left here, that it's a very tight left-hand corner not the tightest corner yet weave it through there and this is all still third gear now break now down to second gear and now down to first gear for the first time and look at the lock the opposite lock there right through there the tightest corner in motorsport which is melko hairpin and then it opens up again as we look back from that melko hairpin down the hill and now the run down towards fishermen's it's up through the gearbox again up to fifth gear now flat out 140 150 miles an hour breaking hard down two more gears into fishermen's trying to get the sweep through here not break too hard but let it car drift as far as you can there uh, as close to the wall as you dare and down towards our bend the last corner here at macau such a vital corner and then swinging it right fourth gear flat out through here tight on the inside trying to let it drift again to the outside as you head down towards reservoir corner the first corner here at macau and that is a lap for the man who knows what he's doing Camini. i wish we could watch the rest of qualifying from the uh, from the cockpit of the cars because that was absolutely superb never do you get such a good idea of the the ups and downs, the undulation, and uh, and just how tight. When we say that there are, are tight corners to negotiate, when you turn the wheel at the Melco hairpin, Amazing. it was like a binary steering wheel. It wasn't <laughs> like a steering wheel, it was like a switch. So all of a sudden on full right lock, and uh, just wonderful, wonderful pictures. Superb. 
Now, this is a two-fold qualifying session. We have 18 minutes left in this, and the top 12 will go through to a qualifying two, and that will decide the grid. Josh Files is getting out by the looks of things, so that's good news. Yep, car makes its way down pit lane, and interesting to see so early on that James Nash had that uh, problem in the Ford and the car was stricken, and it'll be interesting to see if that car has got going again now. I'll tell you what I'm interested to see. It's seven in the morning, yeah. Alan. It's seven in the morning. Did you see the grandstands? I know. I know. <laughs> wow. I, I, only, I, only at Macau. Um, could, could you get this you kind wouldn't of see support? that at Spa, would no, you? you? They wouldn't no, have got out the tent. No, you really wouldn't. Um, and in some parts of the world, they'd be just getting back to their hotels at this time <laughs> in the morning. I did see. I did see the. I saw a young American fellow as I, I left my hotel at six this morning who went, "Have a great day." <laughs> I was like, oh, "Thanks, mate." <laughs> but that's Macau. Now, enough. what's happened here to the windscreen? That's not. That's not planned. That that um, that wouldn't have started this session in that way. And this is Pepe Oriola. So how did that happen? Do you think? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? It is. Definitely happened in this session because you're right. You wouldn't start a session with a with a broken windscreen. But no, you really wouldn't. He's dealing with it. And we, uh, we, we, without the onboard shot, we wouldn't have known that. No. So we're going through Donna Marie again, down towards Melco, and again, I, I, I must emphasise these streets are open at night. And uh, so we've had traffic all the way up to, what, 6 a.m. this morning. So they were closed an hour before we got underway. Uh, but it doesn't give a lot of time. And really, this is the first few laps anyway. Uh, very much uh, a case of sighting whether the, the, the course has changed since yesterday. They raced, uh, practiced yesterday afternoon. Uh, but you never know with conditions. It's definitely cooler than it was yesterday. Yeah, we had the hottest day on Thursday, and uh, it's the hottest Whoa, day. Whoa, look at this, bit of tactics here. <laughs> Stefano Camini says, all right, Pepe, let's see what you got. And you know what? This is really interesting. The Swiss driver being very smart here, tucking himself in behind fellow Sayer driver, Pepe Oriola, but his championship contender, I may add, and Pepe won't like that much because here's what's going to happen. Stefano is going to tuck himself right underneath Pepe and then try to get a slipstream. And uh, as you can see, he's already gone past. And I think that's because Pepe pulled out of it and said, you're not following me, mate. I'm not giving you an extra two seconds. What a, what a fascinating thing to emerge so early on in this uh, in this session. It's yeah. so blatant. Yeah, 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 very much so. Um, well, they've broken apart now. You're quite right. They go around this bar up towards San Francisco. They'll start the climb up the hill. And uh, we've mentioned our onboard shots and... Uh, the, the, the cars that we have onboard cameras in have been very well worked out, haven't they, for this weekend? Yeah, no question. It, it, we're we're, we're going to get some uh, tremendous shots there. A little bit of a lock up there. Slight lock up into hospital. Now down towards maternity. Uh, Kamini on a big lap here. Rob Huff is the fastest man so far at 234.9, and that's not quite up to his 233.7 from practice. But remember, it's early days. 15 minutes left in this session. Expect the times to drop considerably. We have a Brit out front, Pepe Oriola in second place, then Jordi Genet, the fellow Spaniard, in third place. Gleason, the American, is in fourth place. Afanasiev has finally showed up, and when I say that, he hasn't done much in practice, but he's now here, the Russian driver. And Baliki coming back to the series in sixth place. Francisco Mora, then Jordi Oriola. Gianni Morbidelli, who had a steering problem uh, Missed the first session, he's in the top 10, and Stefano Camini, the man we're with and watching at the moment, is still in the top 10, but needs to put in this big lap here at the moment. Just had to negotiate Jordi Genet's car. Oh, already. That's more. You can reverse. A little bit of damage to the left front of the car, but he's able to reverse, so he's not going to hold the session up. Maybe a little bit of debris up there now on the track. So, as you can see, Kamini putting in a very good couple of sectors there. And it'll be interesting to see how he comes across. He's just done his best first sector and second sector. 136.4, and that's right on the money in sector two. Here he comes. Let's see how he goes through the last final part of this course. He comes around the last corner. You can see how hard he's pushing as the car weaves there. He gets very close to the barrier. Crosses so the line close, nice. wasn't it? And no surprise, he's gone right up the board to third quickest with that time, 235.5.
So, Rob Huff in the Honda Civic is quickest after two flying laps. A 2.34.977 is the target time for the rest of the field. And this, the first part of qualifying, if you like. We've got 13 and a half minutes of the session remaining. Rob Huff, Pepe Oriola in pit lane. Comes down pit lane now. Guess what? The Formula One superstar of old, Gianni Morbidelli, has stepped up. Fourth place, and it's great to see him and that Honda Civic where it needs to be. Gianni Morbidelli racing the new spec, or step two as they're calling it, Honda Civic this weekend. And multiple wins, was going for the title, but uh, had a few gremlins and basically put himself out of contention for Macau. But he will be a player and has just gone fourth with it. Started his four days here a little frustratingly, didn't he? Down in uh, pit lane, not able to get out on circuit with uh, a technical problem with the car, uh, preventing him from taking part in free practice one. And this is the first time we've had uh, a competitive session for these cars. And of course, the prestige of the Macau Gear Race 2 litre turbo, something very, very special indeed rich in history yeah i was about to say uh, if you're not familiar with it this is a race that goes back to 1972 and uh, it's it's amazing the greatest tin top drivers in the world have all raced the gear circuit and it remains the ultimate challenge back in 1970 john mcdonald won the race and john was uh, quite a character he won both in two wheels and four wheels uh, back in the day but over the years the likes of tom walkinshaw uh, han stuck uh, you name it, uh, Tim Harvey, Emanuele Piro, Joachim Winkelhock, Andy Prio, and of course Rob Huff, who's still out here right now, and the man you're looking at at the moment. Got an interesting story about Tim Harvey, actually. Um, uh, at one of the little stands just outside the paddock, um, they were selling little model cars, and David Addison, his co-commentator on ITV back in the UK, spotted Tim Harvey's uh, gear race winning Sierra the other day. So he sent him a message, would you like me to pick one up? And Tim said, yes, please, I haven't got that one. If no way! Would, yeah, yeah. So oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, a really good story. That's great. Yeah, they do have all the, the model cars here. What I do love about the car is that the fans that come here had over 80,000 last year. You know, they just, they really, I mean, it's seven in the morning, as I said, and they're here. They love it. They absolutely love cars. They absolutely love racing. And they love the lottery and the gamble that is Macau. Look at this. For the first time, we've got a different name on top. It's a Honda. And it's Kevin Gleason. Great. Kevin Gleason of the United States steps up and winner of one of the races in Singapore. Kevin definitely had a good season this year and uh, he too really looking forward to this weekend. So Mora's car having to be taped up after that uh, little brush with the barriers that we picked up there at the top of the circuit. And Kevin Gleason has a target time now of 2.34.536 with second quickest Rob Huff in pit lane. Pepe Oriola in fourth place. Uh, Chan has gone off. Car number 56. He's had a torrid weekend, Samson Chan. And, and you know, I, I say that because he's a very accomplished driver, this Samson. And he's struggling at the moment. And I don't know whether it's the car or what, but uh, he's just not had a good time of it here at the cab, getting to grips with these TCR spec vehicles. Rob Huff is in the pits. And there's Samson still trying to get it right. And that's at uh, hospital. It's going to require a few more turns as well, isn't it? It is, isn't it? It's a precarious place to be backwards, but it's very fast there, top of the hill. Here's a look inside these two litre turbos. And well, I mean, what's your thought? I mean, obviously, this is. Here's another look at. Oh, boy, Samson was backwards coming in there. Yeah, yeah, he was. Now, I was going to say a red flag came out of there for a minute, but it's not a red flag, it's a wave yellow. Quite a difficult negotiation to get the car very, very tight part of the circuit facing in the right way. And I was about to ask you, yeah. what are your thoughts? We're looking at Rob Huff, who, who has been um, taking part in the World Touring Car Championship, as he has for many years. That continues. Yes. This, is the new spec, this is the new spec touring cars. Your thoughts on um, how this 
how this sits. First time I've seen them, and uh, touring car um, uh, regulations around the world, technical regulations, specifications, um, have to change, they have to move on. Touring car racing becomes increasingly uh, expensive, um, and that is because, because teams, manufacturers, are ultra-competitive around the world, so you'll come up with a format which works very well. Super Touring is a great example. Great cars, um, uh, very, very quick, and the cost of running them just goes up and up and up, and all of a sudden, Sudden, new regulations have to come in. First time I've seen these cars this weekend um, uh, for this uh, for this uh, new addition to the uh, Macau Grand Prix weekend. And yeah, they look absolutely brilliant. It, it, it's great, as you said, that there are so many manufacturers in the, I, I the think first year the, of the series. That's the biggest sell for me yeah. is the fact that um, you know I, 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 we were trying to sort of put a definition on this, and I said these are race cars that the, the common man, you and me, can afford cars like this on the road and therefore these are our cars racing yeah in other words it's great watching gts but i'm never going to own a ferrari i can't no. afford it no you're right <laughs> simple as that i can afford an opal possibly yep. they're the cars of dreams these are the cars of reality well and these are the production based cars yes That's they the are. point looking at josh files briefly and now we're looking at the man in pit lane who tops the times so the top five all down in pit lane now yeah, seven minutes to go in this first qualifying session of two. The top 12 will go through, and that means that the Lorenzo Velia in the Volkswagen Golf TCR is in 12th position. He's in the pits right now, but he perhaps needs to get out because behind him is Mikhail Grachev of Russia. And if you have watched any of the TCR coverage over the year, Grachev is quick. Henry Ho has just gone quicker, and we've also got to keep an eye on the Asian entries, of course, the experts around Macau, and Henry Ho is one of them. He's up to 13th. I've been really impressed with Henry this weekend, really having a good time of it. Behind him, in terms of the Asian entries, they'll have Honda Civic of Sunny Wong, uh, then Rob Hall, uh, excuse me, then Frank Yu in 18th position, Kenneth Lau is 19th, and then Michael Choi, the championship leader in Asia, is in 20th position. Tire swapping going down in pit lane, and uh, we have just under seven minutes of this first part of qualifying uh, remaining. So expect to see cars making their way back out onto the circuit with the top five all in pit lane. Kevin Gleason quickest, uh, Rob Huff second quickest, Jordi Oriola in third place, Pepe Oriola in fourth place, and Stefano Comini in fifth place with Gianni Morbidelli in sixth and still shown as out on track. So Gianni Mor Morbidelli, the only car in the top six who remains out on circuit. Pepe Oriola, after a tyre swap, heads out. Down pit lane, about to rejoin. Now your encyclopedic brain will tell me this. Who did Gianni Morbidelli race for in Formula One? Oh, as we see uh, Wong, Sonny Wong, getting it wrong. Yeah. Shame for the Hong Kong driver, and the good news is that he is oh. able to reverse. And Josh Fars has been pressing on. We were looking at Josh a couple oh, of months ago. Oh, boom! He tried to warn him, and sadly, Wong and you. He needs to take a U turn because he's going the wrong way. That's absolutely right. That is exactly what needs to happen. Everyone else is just about to thread their way through and Yu is able to reverse. Let's hope he hasn't damaged the front of that car too much. It, wa it wasn't a particularly heavy bump, was it? Paul Ridgway on the radio. I love Paul, he's great, isn't he? He's, he's, he's been around Just forever. A huge amount of experience. Yeah, and a huge amount of enthusiasm about what he does with West Coast Racing. And you just saw in the background there, Peter Huff, Rob's um, father, very proud father as well, red flag. Yeah, no surprise, that had to be a red flag, and uh, it's a real shame for Frank Yu coming around the corner there. And uh, he did, obviously, I mean, yeah, he saw the marshal, but it's so hard, you've got an instant to work out which way to go. And here's what happened near the first car. Look, the marshal look at on the top left hand, he's trying desperately to, to warn him, but really, look, you know, <laughs> it's, it's very, where, where does he go? And I'm not going to blame Frank for that, for sure. Uh, What you so just had was, was a, a graphic representation of just how passionate the marshals are. Like they're amazing. Are, uh, they're uh, absolutely amazing. What an incredible thing to do. 
just to make sure that everybody um, hopefully avoids the car. Now, this is going to be interesting. Now, obviously, James Nixon has a very interesting story this weekend because his boys are going for the championship. Let's hear from him. James, one and two so far. You must be very happy. Yeah, what a great lap from Kevin there. He's pulled that one out of the bag. Must be happy to be in front of Rob with all Rob's experience. What about Gianni? He's had problems all weekend, but he seems to be running OK. Yeah, I think the car is running OK now. We found the engine problem from yesterday. But of course, missing the laps from free practice one, he's still working with the chassis set up now. So he's not quite happy with the chassis, but Paul and the guys are going to make some changes now before, before Q2. All right, we'll speak to you later. Thank you, mate. Yeah, a classic tale at Macau, because uh, missing free practice or any practice here at Macau, you are chasing your tail a little bit. And that's definitely the case with Gianni Morbidelli. So everybody stopped up and track. They won't take long over this. Uh, but I was about to say before that interview, as we heard from James Nixon there from West Coast Racing, uh, and thanks to Mark James with the interviews, um, five minutes to go. And this is going to create quite a situation because, as I said, if you're Kevin Gleason or Rob Huff, you might sit it out. Here's another look at what happened. First car, Josh filed. Josh did well, didn't he? Yeah, he filed by. He did, yeah. <laughs> you took a U-turn. And very safely as well. Boom. Yeah. Uh, but Not if too heavy. Not no, too it heavy. wasn't too heavy, in fact. And in fact, the car will probably be OK. Uh, Gleason, Huff, Oriola, they may sit this out the last finish, uh, last five minutes, or at least not try to go too hard in pushing for an extra lap. But the likes of Mikhail Grechev and Lorenzo Velia uh, may well push on now. Velia in, currently in 12th position, because the reason being that you want to get through to the second qualifying situation here and go for, for broke. A little bit of damage there to Morris car. We saw him stopped up earlier on, but they've taped it up, as you can see. And, uh, yeah, this gives them maybe a couple of extra moments to make sure that everything is safely attached. It's a great shame when you see these uh, little scrapes that the tin tops get because the, the level of preparation of these cars is, as you would expect, absolutely supreme. And when they come back looking a little bit secondhand and a little bit war-wounded, it's, uh, yep, sad to see but no doubt they'll be fettled back to showroom condition before we uh, get our first race of the weekend underway tomorrow. The Honda just being carefully eased onto the back of the recovery vehicle. And on board with Pepe Oriola's car. No question about which car it is. It's the one with uh, two halves to the windscreen, isn't it? It's uh, perfectly divided by that crack, which one runs from side to side of the windscreen. I'm guessing a little bit of Davy threw up uh, down the back, uh, down the main straight, and uh, that kind of speed just, just cracked it. Yeah, quite a long crack as well. Having a good, good look around uh, Pepe Oriola's car, who has uh, shined here at Macau in the past in uh, the gear race. Five minutes and 32 seconds of this session remain, and got a good view of normal life continuing around Macau while uh, we have a qualifying session our first one of the day we start early in the day normally it's the motorcycles which uh, take to the track at 7:30. but this year for the first time a, a timetable change oh, a bit of fluid has been spilt down there as well which is being dressed by the uh, marshals and more recoveries to be completed as well very impressive how quickly these uh, cars are, are craned out of the way the only way that you can uh, recover these vehicles particularly if steering or suspension has been damaged you know what i was just looking at you know you mentioned pepe and how, how successful he's been in the past and i'm just looking at his record he has he's been right there at the sharp end of every championship he's been in he's been part of the world touring car championship for some years now he was second in the European Championship uh, for Touring Cars in 2011. But, as far as I can gather, he's yet to really win any major Touring Car titles. And this is his opportunity this weekend. And he's still a young man. Oh, gosh. So, uh, so yeah. It's 21 years of age. An exciting career in prospect. And it's always rather nice when a driver decides early on in his career that he wants to go yeah. down the tin top route rather than... Um, uh, it's not right to say wasting years hoping to get into Formula One. Um, but, it, but no, I think that's a fair, co fair comment because there's a lot of drivers who, 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 who keep that dream alive and, and it's not productive.
because they could have a, a fantastic career and an enjoyable one racing. You're, you're, well, essentially what you're doing is possibly using up years that you could be doing what Pepe has done, which is to, 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 to learn the craft of tin top racing, which is different to yeah. racing a single seater. You know, it's funny, I've, I spent a lot of time with um, Alexander Rossi, the current uh, Marussia Formula One driver. And, um, and I say current because he's only had five drives, which he'll, uh, he's had five drives, he'll go back to GP2 uh, to probably finish runner-up in that championship. But uh, the GP2 series this year for him, because he literally, when he was at Caton, took a year out uh, from racing. And that was the biggest... I said, what's the hardest part? He said, not racing. I hate it. Uh, you do all the training, you do all the simulation, and you don't get to race. And he said, that's all I want to do. He even did a, a stint with uh, the Daytona 24 hours at one point, um, just to you know, keep his iron. And there's the great Mike Curtis, one of the stalwarts of Asian Roll. racing. Roll half. Two minutes he just drifted out of sight there. But a uh, good part of Motorsport Asia and helping the Asian TCR Championship and GT Championship for many years. And look at him go. Incredibly industrious, the... Uh track workers and we have lots of them as well and if you bear in mind that we started on circuit this morning at 7 30 with the first track activity these guys have to be on post way earlier than that it's a really long day yeah i think they close the track of <clears throat> I, th I think they close the track about five uh, and then they start to do <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> there's a lot of energy He's getting psyched up look at him go lane, come on it? stefano <laughs> <laughs> Very keen to be back out on circuit. <laughs> He's ready to go, isn't he? One of the one of the great things about Macau is this is a meeting that drivers, teams, officials look forward to for a long time, pretty much 365 days of the year. And there is an end of term feeling, isn't there? Look at his leg. He's so pumped and ready to go. Yeah, that's interesting. I always like looking at championship protagonists in the final uh, weekend of a year when uh, there's a title to be decided. And look at their demeanor. Yeah. And uh, the, the ones by and large that I've seen over the years that are nervy and um, quiet. Edgy. Yeah, they, they tend not to perform as, as, uh, as well as the ones that have got a bit of a swagger um, uh, and, and, and that inner self-confidence that seems to shine through. So it's this, uh, <clears throat> this circuit demands that you do have not only your wits about you, it's not about being metronomically precise. It's about having your wits. It's about reacting. Look at this. Yes. Look at that track right now. It's covered in dust and dirt and oil and nastiness. And they're about to throw themselves at that. Someone like Rob Huff, totally prepared for that and uh, <laughs> totally at ease with dealing with that. It's not for everyone. He's always the calmest and coolest of drivers. He's just uh, unbelievable, particularly here around uh, the Macau circuit, where uh, the natural instinct would be to be um, yeah, quite serious about this because it's a serious circuit. Well, while we've got a moment in this session stop, Richard Coleman is down in the pit lane and Mark James is going to have a quick word with him. Richard, a pause for the red flag, but it seems that your guys are well placed. Yeah, yeah, it's a difficult session. Uh, we expected the red flag a little bit earlier. It's a shame one of our other cars is involved, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, the circuit's getting a lot quicker at the moment, so um, we always knew we had to get our first run and the circuit's getting quicker, but we're okay at the moment. We might go out and warm up a set of rears uh, to go on the front for the next next run, but we should be okay for uh, for Q1. All going to plan. So far. Speak to you later. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. All going to plan. So far. Yeah, as I expected, the Luke Oil team, the Craft Bamboo Luke Oil team have had a brilliant run so far this year. And as I predicted, uh, I think uh, this is a case of, he just mentioned that uh, put a couple of tyres on and just sort of, you know, get ready effectively for Q2 because I don't think anybody's going to throw them off where they are at the moment. Uh, and they're all where they need to be, which is the top 12. You never answered my question. Gianni Morbidelli, who did he race for? Um, was test driver for Ferrari. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, but he 
did drive. He did drive. For I'll, I'll come back to that. I got halfway there, didn't you? You did. Thank you. All I know, it was a white car. I want to say, I want to say Tyrrell, but no. No, what was it? I'm going to have to look. Okay. Well, we've sent Alan off to the the vaults, to the library. The library. <laughs> and look at this. We're getting. I can see out of the corner of my eye. We're in a red flag situation, but I'm watching the um, the grid girls getting ready for the first race of the weekend coming up. And it's such a it's such a festival here. That's what I love about it. Not only do we have great racing and great track races, but uh, they turn this into a complete festival. Uh, and the whole of Macau is involved. And as predicted, I think a few drivers will wait out this last five minutes, especially if they've kind of done their business, so to speak. Let me just run through it. Kevin Gleason is the fastest man so far, 234.5. Uh, an excellent lap by him in the Honda Civic, and it's Honda 1-2 as Rob Huff follows him through with a 234.9. Jordi Oriola is ahead of Pepe in third and fourth place, both in Seat Leones, and Stefano Camini is in fifth place, so he's got where he needs to be. Uh, then it's Gianni Morbidelli. Afanasiev is seventh at the moment. Jordi Gine is eighth. Andrea Baliki is in ninth position. Rodolfo Avia, the local man, is in tenth. Really enjoying his outing, I'm sure. Francisco Mora, who was involved in that incident, is 11th. And then Lorenzo Velia rounds out the top 12. Will that change, we wonder? Henry Ho is 13th. Grechev, 14th. Sonny Wong, who was also uh, in an incident earlier, 15th. Then Josh Biles, who had a problem at the beginning of the session in 16th. Frank Yu, who smashed into the back of one of the stricken cars in 17th. Then Rob Holland. But a good weekend for the American, Rob, uh, down in 18th position. Yem Cunnington is in 19th position and in the pits right now. And Michael Choi is 20. This is going to be interesting, isn't it? The final uh, five minutes of this first part. That's Pepe Oriola heading up the hill. Uh, in answer to your question, uh, Gianni Morbidelli actually did a Grand Prix for Ferrari after uh, Alan Prost left in uh, the Aus uh, Australian Grand Prix in 1991. Uh, and also drove in his Formula One career for Scuderia Italia, which was Dallara, Minardi, then Ferrari Footwork and Sauber. Footwork, that's who I was thinking. That's the white car. That's the white car. There you go. That was interesting. There were a lot of cars stopped just as we threaded our way round. We're looking at the back of Rob Huff's car. We're on board with but uh, there seemed to be quite a few cars stopped on the right-hand side of the circuit there, which is interesting. Stefano Comini in the pit lane, so too Gianni Morbidelli, who was putting a brave face on things at the start of the weekend, but frustrated to watch the circuit while he remained in pit lane. But that's Rob Huff in this very brightly liveried Honda for this weekend, leading the way with Pepe Oriola just behind. Rob Huff, who became a touring car driver, first in the BTCC as a result of winning the Seat Cooper Championship. The prize was one year drive as a works driver with Seat in the BTCC, and Rob has never looked back since winning that uh, one make championship. He also got use of a flat for the year in Monaco, which. Um, That's a better prize, surely. It was Jason Plato's flat, so they had to share it <laughs> for a year. Um, and they became good friends, firm friends, during that uh, that year. That sounds like a precarious position to be in, roommate uh, to Jason Plato. I, I, I think that both of them um, uh, thoroughly enjoyed the year that they got to know each other. And uh, what a great way to join touring car racing. Uh, Rob hasn't looked back, has he? He's uh, just made for tin top racing. Yeah, and he's one of the great characters of motor racing. I mean, you know, I put him up there with the likes of Tom Coronel. And Peter Dunbrek, you know, great characters, fantastic peddlers, but great characters. Tricky moment there, coming out of Melko Hairpin. We could have had a, a second stoppage. Here we go then, the last few minutes of the first qualifying session.
for the gear race, the Sun City Group Macau gear race for 2015. An all new era for Tin Tops here at Macau as this fantastic story continues. Rob Huff being wheeled back. Gleason is in, the man who's fastest so far. Going out though is Pepe Oriola. What can he do in the last two minutes, I wonder? Everybody jostling for position, trying to get into a situation where they can get into the top 12. Josh Files went straight on there. Rob Holland was following and was able to continue. That was down at Lisboa. One thing that Rob Holland does is he always drives a car with a very, very impressive and distinctive, liver distinctive livery. And it's... Uh, no exception this weekend, is it? Very striking looking car for Rob Holland. Drove a full year in the BTCC last year in 2014. He's driven um, selective meetings this year. The car that he drove last year in the BTCC um, has been driven this year for part of the season by Nicholas Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton's uh, oh, that's younger right, brother, yeah. Rob Holland. How's he going? Uh, very, very well. He's uh, an incredibly inspirational young man. He is just amazing. Overcoming the odds to become yeah, a race well, Yeah, tell me this story, well, because uh, not a lot of people know it. Uh, well, it, 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 essentially, um, uh, Nick, uh, six years ago, seven years ago, when he was following his brother around the world, was in a wheelchair. And uh, uh, he, he's, um, he's disabled. He was in a wheelchair and was very, very good at computer driving games and was able to beat his world champion brother time and time and time again in, uh, in a simulation and then became quite determined to race a car himself. So set about diligently working on his legs to give himself the, the strength and the upper body strength as well to race a car. Was he paralyzed or? Um, no, he, he has, uh, I forget the name of, of, the, uh, of the illness oh, that he has, but, but, but I shall look it up and, and be able to tell you. Um, but what he was able to do was to get the body strength, get out of the wheelchair. Amazing. Race in a, uh, a, in a Renault Clio. And uh, then his dream was to be in a BTCC car, which he did this year, selective rounds this year. Um, but just the most amazingly inspirational thing, uh, conversation that I had with him this year was when I said to him, are you in pain during a weekend? You know, are, are, you, are you bothered, um, um, uh, particularly after three races? He said, well, as the weekend goes on, now I have a little bit of, of uh, therapy, and that keeps me going. On Monday, I go in for a longer session where they pop my ribs back in. And I said, I beg your pardon? And he said, yeah, yeah, I need, um, you know, six or seven ribs up over the weekend will pop out, and they just need to be popped back in uh, on, a, on a Monday morning. Goodness gracious. Yeah. And I think that's possibly why Lewis is what Lewis is, because he understands that. And that's an incredible story. People don't know sometimes the backdrop. Checkered flag is out. And Gleason, Huff, Oriola, in fact, both Jordi and Pepe are right there in the top four. Kamini is where he needs to be. He's in the top five. Janet Morbidelli, six. Apanasiev in seventh. And Jordi Janet, eight. Yep, Nick suffers from cerebral palsy, and uh, when, when I asked him to describe exactly what that meant, um, he said, "Well, it just makes me floppy," which is which is the perfect example, uh, perfect description of, mm. of, of of what he suffers. Um, but if ever there was a story of somebody that, that you know is facing a, a challenge and somebody that overcomes that challenge, he is the man. Brilliant. So we await now. And I'm sure we'll hear from a few drivers, but Morbidelli gets the door open. And we have a, a slight waiting period, effectively, until we head off for qualifying two. But now qualifying one is complete, and the top 12, Belia did make it, and we'll go through Henry Ho, 13th, just missing out. Great stuff by Kevin Gleason, and it's Honda 1, 2, Seat 3, 4, and 5, and then Honda again in sixth place with Gianni Morbidelli.
So let's go down to the pit lane with Mark James and hear from Target Competition and how they're getting on. Yeah, we have uh, every guy in the top 10, so uh, every guy is in the last crew too. Hopefully now it's better, it's very slippery, and we had a little crash with more. I, I hope now the cars not have big damage to Posito in crew too. Are you surprised at Jordi's pace? Shortly. Yeah, very, yeah he said always it was incredible lap. He don't know if he can repeat that. I'm very happy with him because he comes from uh, Euro Cup and now he's with us in DCL and he makes a so good job today and also yesterday. I'm very happy. Is there much work for the team to do in repair time? No, I don't think uh, the... The car seems a little bit damaged, but uh, the steering is okay, so we think no job. Thank you. So, target competition, very happy at the moment, and uh, we have a little bit of lull in the proceedings as we go between qualifying one and qualifying two. You're watching the Macau Grand Prix 2015, a brand new era for the gear race, and... Uh, Huge tradition and history, very much the backbone, the gear race of the Macau Grand Prix. And uh, to be honest, it's got a bigger history than Formula 3. Everybody talks about the headline Formula 3, and now the GTs are making their way into the history books as well. But let's not forget where it all started, because uh, the gear race has been probably one of the most stunning spectacles over the years without a doubt and i'll never forget the schnitzer bmws charlie lamb steve soper coming here andy prio dominating and winning three world titles right here at macau and uh, yeah it's just uh, it's 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 steeped in fantastic history and pepe oriola the man you're looking at right now or at least his car is trying to do the same and emulate those that have gone before him and become a champion himself this weekend. The huge respect that you get if you're known as an expert around this circuit. It's just amazing, the global respect that you get. For many, many years, Andy Prio was known if there was a championship battle to win and it finished here at Macau, everybody's smart money would go on Andy Prio Absolutely. this weekend. And uh, uh, in, in more recent years, everybody would... Uh, Put 5p on Rob Huff taking at least one win when you come in a tin top to the gear circuit here at Macau. Huge, huge respect for anybody that's able to master this circuit in any form of race car or motorcycle. It's just the most amazing circuit. Now, interestingly enough, uh, that's interesting. Just looking at who's qualified for... Yeah, no, it's as we expected. Cars 24, 12, 21, 74, 25, 10, 77, 88, 33, 87, 50, and 7. And that'll only mean something to you if you're watching live timing. But I can tell you that the likes of Lorenzo Vella, Grechev, Morbidelli, Huff are all going through into this final second qualifying session. Yeah, we've got a, a timing screen at the moment that's sorting itself out and getting itself ready for the second part of qualifying. And the cars are released out onto the circuit. They peel out of pit lane, just out of view of our um, commentary box here. You can just see them go down the left-hander as they exit the pit lane and get out onto circuit. And once again, the weaving of the cars to get heat into the tyres. So their first flying hat. I'm going to keep an, a watchful eye on Rob Huff and where he tries to place himself here. He's weaving himself. He's just got ahead of Gianni Morbidelli, who, of course, is in a Honda himself. And I wonder if Gianni will uh, slot himself next to uh, Rob and the pair of them trying to work together. I've seen Rob over the years use this qualifying session, and the smart guys do, because of this long, long straight that you're looking at right now on the exit of Mandarin. You do get a chance to slipstream, and you do get a chance to effectively create a little bit of a uh, slingshot and maybe add some time or lose some time in your qualifying and uh, we'll see how they play it now will the Seats get together will the Hondas get together certainly Jordi Genet and Pepe Oriola are together on track you can see them just going through your shot there and here is Pepe 
And don't forget, of course, bragging rights is very much the touring cars, all about the manufacturers. And um, if Seat can continue to dominate this series, um, the likes of Volkswagen, Honda, Ford will be present. Subaru still having some gremlins at the moment. We had hoped to see uh, Alain Manu involved this weekend, but sadly, uh, still got some engine problems with that Subaru. And uh, it will get together, I'm sure. But uh, we didn't get to see the mighty Alain Menu, multiple winner here at Macau himself, take to the track, unfortunately. He had one session and uh, it all came to naught. He completed about half a lap, as uh, far as I remember. And uh, that's, uh, for me, a real disappointment. I was so pleased to read that uh, the double BTCC champion would be here. And uh, he was here, and we, we had a shot of him before the first session of the weekend got underway. He looked bouncy and smiley, didn't he? And then all of a sudden, a problem. Now, watch second. Stefano Camini right here now, trying to get past Jordi Oriello, because uh, he wants to get past him immediately. Here he is going down towards Fisherman's, and look at him slowing him down here. And I bet you this is not what the <laughs> immediately Stefano jinks out and gets out of the way and passed. So then, starting to form up now and starting to create a situation for a lap in anger here at Macau. We have 12 minutes remaining in the second qualifying session. Everybody warming the tyres up and now in full flight is Jordi Janay coming down towards Mandarin Corner. In the Luke Oil, Seat. And this is the first flying lap and it's all Seat's one, two, three at the moment. As we look at Pepe Oriola, the 21-year-old Spaniard who has a chance of beating Camini for the title. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see how these two shuffle out in this amazing field and also how they deal with what will be carnage, I'm sure, because I would uh, eat my hat if there is no damage at all in a clean race in both of these touring car races because it's just too tempting to go too fast and hit the walls here. But when you've got a championship on the line, you've got to be careful. So 12 cars in this second segment of qualifying. Just trying to get the cars up to temperature and early in the morning temperature pretty low this morning as I came in. Humidity was high, but uh, compared to the blistering sunshine that we had from sunrise on Thursday morning, and all of a sudden yesterday, it became a little bit more typical as far as the weather was concerned, a bit more cloud base, a bit of cloud cover this time of year normally in this region of the world. And we're looking at Pepe Oriola threading his way up towards the Final few turns of this gear circuit. Pepe Oriola in the Sayat comes up to complete the lap and we'll see what the first of the flying laps is going to be. Stefano Comini has gone purple in sector two and then Rob Huff has gone purple in sector two. Jordi Genet goes quickest briefly, Pepe Oriola in second, this is the first of the flying laps. But I'm sure that Rob Huff is going to cross the line when he finishes his lap and steal it by a, a massive margin. His second sector, a 134.04 compared to 136.40 by, uh, and Kamini goes quickest for now, but Huff is still to complete the lap. Kamini goes quickest, and, and then Huff Rob Huff quickest. takes over. Yep. 232.1, that's the benchmark for everybody to chase. Morvedelli goes second place in the Honda Civic. Kamini third in the Seat. Jordi Genet is in fourth. We've got all the players. There is Rob Huff on stream, and he's got Kamini behind him. So this is going to be an interesting lap. What can they pull off here? I, the one man I would love to be behind is Rob Huff, 
if I were trying to put a lap in. He did that lap behind Jordi Oriola, didn't he? Yep. And now he's just been able to squeeze past, goes around this bar. Look how inch perfect his car placement is. He is never more than an inch away from the barriers on the exit of the corner. Absolutely supreme. Supreme. It's funny because you watch him drink a beer and you never see, you never <laughs> think that that was that, that was the man. He's never that qu pr quite precise with his glass of beer. I um, I, well, I, I missed the party um, <laughs> when he celebrated the uh, the world title here in Macau, but he had quite a party. The family were all over here. His wife was over here, and uh, it was quite a celebration after the uh, official presentation on the Sunday night here just a few years ago when he secured the World Touring Car title here at Macau. Look at Pepe Oriola. Yeah, the entrance to police is much tougher than it looks. Uh, when you actually go on board, you see that there's a rise into it, effectively, so you're breaking uphill, uh, and that's always uh, a double-edged sword. The undulation of the circuit is, is brilliantly depicted when we go on board with these cars. So pleased that we've got these uh, on-board shots. Oh, dear, Gianni Morbidelli. No, of all people. Morbidelli was second quickest, and they've got to be quick now careful, to warn oh, everybody's piling up, but that's pretty much going to end this session, uh, at least, uh, or stop this session, I would have said, because there's no way anybody can get a lap in. They've got a red flag, and they have. Yep, with seven minutes and 12 seconds of this session remaining. But that's very interesting indeed, because Gianni Morbidelli now will take no further part in this qualifying session. He is second at the moment with 234.6, um, but whether he'll stay there is another yeah, question. One flying lap, that's all he's had. One flying lap. Jordi Genet comes into pit lane, so too Pepe Oriola. And with the red flag flying, so that we can recover Gianni Morbidelli's car. And that was very lucky. Here we go. Kisses at the back, spits it round into the barrier on the right. And Gianni Morbidelli is parked at 45 degrees to the barrier and very, very lucky that those cars uh, were able to break in time. And as the cars make their way back into pit lane, we need to get ourselves ready for a restarted final sprint for pole position for the 2015 Sun City Group Macau Gear Race 2 litre T. Second segment of qualifying, if you're just joining us, the local time, 8.23 here at Macau. And following this session, which will determine the grid for the first of our two races for these touring cars, we will have here at Macau our first race of the weekend. Looking forward to two of the local races support races starting with the Macau Road Sport Challenge a huge entry we always get for these uh, modified saloons that will be coming up next and following that the Sun City Lotus Celebrity Cup race where local celebs singers entertainers actors dentists dentists celebrity dentists will all take to the circuit in identical Lotus cars and they will be our first two races of the weekend Meanwhile, we've got qualifying business to complete. And as cars come into pit lane, tyre swapping taking place. Perhaps um, a little earlier than they would have expected. Yeah, I've got to say, this is kind of, um, I think if, if it hadn't have been red flagged, I think they would have done a couple more laps on those tyres yeah, and then two, come in for those. Two more um, laps, I reckon. Yep. But instead, they've decided, well, look, this is going to be a six minute session or just under and so really you're going to get a couple of laps and you may as well put your best on now because this is going to be literally the, the last throw of the dice five wheel studs to be taken out of each of the wheels so it's uh, not a formula one type tire change for these cars it takes a little bit longer than that but these teams are incredibly effective at doing it and uh, are able to turn the cars around very very quickly So all of a sudden the car park is released and we get a green light in pit lane. That, that was, was quick. Very, yeah, very quickly quick. organized. Well done. Yep, Huff is out. The circuit workers, yeah, very, very good indeed. Here we go then. 
So the final part of second qualifying for the Sun City Group, Macau Gear Race for 2015, Rob Huff leads the way with a 232.1 at the moment. Gianni Morbidelli caused the red flag and will not take any further part, but currently is second with 234.6. Um, Kamini, Janae, Oriola and Apanasia round out the top six. That will change, I'm sure, before the end of this last five minutes of qualifying. We're with Rob Huff as he dives into Lisboa. Yep, weaving the car from side to side. This the outlap from pit lane. And is he at the front of the queue, which he was yeah. not last time? Uh, he's not quite at the front. I think there's a car in front of him, but he's got some clean air. He's got sure. a fair bit of clean air. And last time when he was out on track, he was very much in the uh, in the collection of touring cars, wasn't he? He had uh, Jordi Oriola directly in front of him for the first of his flying laps. There you see one. Yeah, there's two cars in front of uh, yeah. Rob, but. Uh, like I said, he's got a distance between them. He's got breathing space, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely vital. So, we're looking at Rob Huff, super sub for this weekend. If you wanted someone to bring in for Miguel, who else would you pick? Well, Rob Huff. Andy Prio. Andy Prio, yeah. He's probably done enough races this this year. He's been such a, a busy driver. As, Ivan uh, Muller. Uh, uh, Andy Prio. Uh, Ivan, Ivan Muller would be a good super sub. Well, Alan Menu was supposed to go wheel to wheel with him. It didn't turn out, unfortunately. So, on board with Stefano Comedy as they thread their way up the very tight section of the circuit to be weaving the car, isn't it? So keen to get as much heat as possible into the tyres to go on to the first of the flying lap since the session has been restarted after Gianni Morbidelli's car was recovered from uh, an incident out on circuit and they've only got three minutes and 50 seconds left in which to do it this is going to be a very exciting culmination to qualify it's one flyer isn't it really and the first of the flyers is away and I'm going to keep an eye on when Rob Huff comes around the corner because that is it's hammer time, as Lewis Hamilton would say, because he is going to press the metal to the floor and go for it. Here we go. Through go the Seat. Fast start commentary position, which is right by the start finish line. And here comes Rob Huff to start his big lap. He leads the way at the moment with a 232.1. Who's going to improve? Let's take a look at the sector signs as they go through one by one final qualifying then and the stopwatches are ready to go and so are we and away it does go through reservoir down towards mandarin one of the most famous corners in motor racing a blind entry and gleason who was quickest earlier on comedy flat out through there the swiss oh that was very close it was almost a swiss roll if he wasn't careful but he's made it and everybody on a big lap right now. This is it. These last few minutes through San Francisco. Jinking right. Up the hill now. Full power through here. Everyone line astern. In terms of the sector times, Comedy does a 26.4. That's amazing. 26.6 by Rob Huff. So... First blood, if you will, goes to Stefano Camini with a 26.43. But everybody who is in contention, Afanas included, Afanasiev included, 26.7, 26.7 from Jordi Janay. And uh, sadly, Morbidelli not part of the action. And we'll look to the second sector times. It's a long way to that second sector. But this is the sector you're looking at right now, and it's the mountain section as we describe it. And it's, uh, the hill section above Macau winds through the hills. Oh, no! Big off! Again. And he's got it going amazingly, and that will not stop the race. Wow. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. Massive shunt. And uh, Francisco Mora just reacted brilliantly there. For the second time, and damages the repaired front left of the car that the team have been working on with, with tape for some time. Oh, dear. 
And a 133.4 in sector two by Rob Huff. He's on it as expected. He's huffing and puffing, and he's going to blow them all away if he can. Jordan Janay comes to the line now. His lap is complete. Where does he move? Jordi Janay goes to second. A 132.1 from Huff, a 134.0. So Huff has just laid down a massive lap to say, what do you got, everybody? <laughs> and of course, he's quite a few smiles on the pit wall. I'm sure they were expecting a lap, but what a lap it was. 231.522, Gleason goes second, taken over by Comedy. Comedy goes second. He's uh, got purple in sector one on that lap. Huff got purple in sector two and three. 231.522, almost two seconds quicker than Comedy in second. And these all will get one more flying lap out of this sec section. And whoa, that was close. And Comedy's on it again. Will anybody improve? They're all chasing Rob Huff, a 131.5. Comedy, as you say, second at the moment. Pepe Oriola, where will he line up on the grid? Final chance, here goes Rob Huff. Clear track in front, clear track behind as well. What will Rob be able to do on this lap? He was a personal best in the first sector, not as quick as Comedy was previously. A 26.53 in sector number one. But this is the all-important sector. Rob Huff, so far, looks to be on another very, very quick and clean lap. His first sector, a 26.5, and that was equal by Kevin Gleason, 26.51. In fact, Gleason just a, a smidgen quicker, but not much. And likewise, identical first sector from Pepe Ariola. It's going to be close. It's going to be nip and tuck in this one. It's all about the second sector, which Rob Huff is about to complete in about 20 seconds or so. He comes to the top of Morris Hill and blows it. Straight in, wow. straight on. And they just parked it. He'll reverse it and try to get it going again. But that's Rob Huff's day gone. And 231.5, is it good enough? We're about to find out. They're trying to stop him from getting back on track, but he's uh, carefully making his way back on. Will he upset the apple cart, I wonder? Everybody else is trying to put a lap in. And that shows you just how hard Rob was pushing, doesn't it? Yeah, a very, rare mistake. Very rare. Now, can anybody, Comedy, Gleason, Oriola, Janae, stop Rob Huff? Because he's out of proceedings now with the clock ticking down to zero. Here we go. These are the laps that are going to make the difference. 134.8. 138.6. I don't think anybody's got anything, to be honest. No. He's a lucky boy as well. Didn't damage the car. Camini goes second. Great work by the Swiss driver to take second place ahead of Jordi Janay. Pepe Oriola is still fourth, but I think that's pretty much how we're going to pan out for this session. Rob Huff, despite that uh, Moorish Hill uh, exit, is going to stay. But Gleason goes second. Gleason comes across the line with a 233.1. There's still one and a half seconds off Huff's time, which is insane. But Gleason takes second place away from Kamini. Kamini will start on the second row, and that's pretty much how it all panned out. The checker flag continues to wave, but I think we've got our list. And good to see Rodolfo Villa getting into the top ten as well. I wonder if we're going to hear from uh, Rob Huff. I'll, uh, I'll be keen to, to hear his thoughts after that uh, astonishing lap. Quite rightly, congratulations going on down in pit lane. But a 231.522, just over one and a half seconds quicker than the second quickest car of Kevin Gleason. Very impressive as always, Rob Huff. Oh, without doubt, uh, incredible. Stefano Comini third, Jordi Genet in fourth place, and a qualifying session that was interrupted quite a few times, wasn't it, in the first uh, sec section of qualifying and the second sec section of qualifying as well, and never were drivers able to get into uh, a flowing rhythm of lap after lap, so often the way here at Macau, it's uh, just part of the fabric of the weekend, isn't it? Yep, no question about it. And, um, well, <clears throat> it was a stop-start session, not the most uh, intense in, in terms of sessions, and we had to wait till the final moments of it. Rob Huff, as expected, I suppose, put in an absolutely gigantic lap of 
He was the fastest man around here last year in 2014 in the World Touring Car Spec. Um, and he's done it again here in the new TCR era for touring cars and the gear race. So then, we wait for confirmation, but uh, the way I see it, the front row is Huff and Gleason. Kamini starts third, and Jordi Genet for Pepe Oriola. Fighting for the championship will start fifth, and that's disappointment for him. Gianni Morbidelli drops to six after that incident. Uh, that had him in second going into the last uh, sector, but he calls the red flag and stays now in sixth place. Jordi Oriola in seventh, Afanasia. Sergei Afanasiev in eighth position, Andrei Veliki in ninth, and Rodolfo Javier in tenth position. Just looking down the uh, the times, Johnny. Johnny Morbidelli didn't lose out too badly, did didn't he? Didn't do too bad, did he? No, down in sixth place, the outside of row number three. And the car wasn't uh, damaged too badly, which is good news for Gianni. Pepe Oriola steps out of the car. Kevin Gleason arrives. He could be very happy yeah. with the job he's just done. Well impressed with Kevin. That's uh, a very, very good lap into Park Femme, they go. Stefano Comedy brings his car to a stop. And very soon, we'll be racing, but this confirmation of the grid. Yep, there you see it, Rob Huff in pole position with the 231.5. Gleason, Comedy, Janae, Oriola, Pepe Oriola, and Comedy fighting for the championship, remember, third and fifth, Morbidelli sixth, Oriola, Jordi in seventh position, Afanasiev, Rounds out the top eight. Then it's Baliki. Avia, the local man from Macau, in 10th position, coming out from GTs. Then Veliat, Mora. Ho, Henry Ho, also of Macau, in 13th place. Grachev of Russia is in 14th place. And then Wong and Files. Disappointment for Josh Files. Frank Yu, also involved in an incident, will start 17th. Rob Holland, Cunnington, Choi, Michael Choi, leading the Asian Championship in 20th position, ahead of Kenneth Lau. And a little further down, Disappointment for Douglas Koo and Huang of Taipei in 25th place. So then, that's how it all rounded out for the Sun City Group Macau Gear Race. Racing will commence tomorrow, and it's going to be a lot of fun to see the gear race in full swing in this new era for Tint Tops. Bye. Opa Comini style. I'm going to do a bounty.